All right. All right. Good morning, church family. How are we doing this morning? Well, you know, you know what this, you know what scripture says, where, where two or more are gathered in my name, there I am among them. So we know that the Lord is with us this morning. But here, here's what I love about, like, about leading when there's not as many people, is that it gives us more of an opportunity to shout it out. So that's exactly what I want us to do this morning. I want us to worship God. I want us to proclaim his holy name together. So why don't we stand up as we praise the name of the Lord. Church. Just gonna read this up. I 
believe you gave sight to the blind. I believe that the dead came to life. I believe there were wonders inside, but you're still the same. I believe every word that you say. I believe there are scars in your head. That your goodness is good without it. We'll tell of your wonders, sing of your grace. The God of creation knows me by name. The Lord is faithful yesterday, now, and always. Oh, your mercy is mighty, age after age. And all generations will bow down in praise the Lord.
hands out on me. Sing it out, church. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Shut this up. Everybody take a seat for just a second. We have a little video we want you to enjoy. Ooh, it's another hot one out there. Temps reaching over 100 degrees today. Hope you're keeping cool and having fun on this hot summer day. Now, let's get back. Ken has an announcement for you about VBS. Morning, church. That looks like fun, doesn't it? Well, all of you can be a part of diving into friendship with God as well. We are absolutely thrilled to announce that our theme this year is scuba, and VBS for us is going to run July 8th through 12th. It's a Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to noon each day. We have a preschool program for those entering 4K and 5K in the fall, and an elementary program for kids entering first through fifth grade. This summer, we will be hosting VBS at our Trever Church. So it's gonna be a bit different, and I'm sorry that you're not all gonna be able to see the fully decked out church, but there's many ways that you can, and one of those is sign up as a volunteer. So our link is on the River Ridge website, as well as we have Joan in the back who will gladly help you sign up as a volunteer today. Another option, um, we have flyers that you can take and we're asking you to please take these flyers and pass them out. So those of you who have children or you have grandchildren who have attended before, you know exactly what VBS is about and what we do here about sharing the gospel of God with these children. It is the most important outreach program we do, do for our children here at River Ridge. So we encourage you, if your children are older, um, but you have grandchildren, get your grandchildren here. I personally can attest, this is my favorite vacation of the year. One of our grandchildren comes in from out of state to attend VBS, and it is just a beautiful time together. If you have children in the neighborhood or your coworkers have children, please share this with them. Our goal is to get 100 children to VBS this year. We usually hit that mark, but we're aiming for it again. Other ways that you can help us, we really are looking for some donations that helps us keep the cost down. The cost for VBS, and there is a benefit for signing up early, if you sign up in the next few days, the month of May, you will pay only $25 a child. That is for all five days. If you sign up in the month of June, $30 per child for all five days, and the month of July, $35. Now, for those of you that are blessed with a big, beautiful family, we cap out at the price of $75 per family. 
so you'll only pay for three children, even if you have four lovely, five lovely, six lovely children, or you have an abundant full quiver. We want all of them to attend VBS. The third way that you can also help us, we are having a crafting event on May 18th right here at this church from one to three. So whether you are extremely creative or semi-creative, or you're like me and you burn your fingers every time a hot glue gun comes out, we want you to come and help us because we need to deck out Trever Church with a coral wreath. So we are gonna be making all kinds of really super fun decorations that make it even more fun for the children to learn. So we are hoping that you will join us. We encourage you to please spread the word, share the word, and sign your children up early. And we really hope to see you there because it really is an incredible blessed time. Lastly, the thing that we need all of you to do, pray. Please pray for these children. Pray for them to have seeking hearts for God. And there is a huge opportunity. They will meet God at VBS. And please pray for our volunteers. So thank you very much. Thanks. So let me say that uh, VBS is very important to our church, and we take very seriously uh, what God said to the Jewish people in Deuteronomy 6, that they were to pass their, their faith on down to their children and their children's children. So we, we work hard to do that and to share the good news with our kids. So um, I encourage you, invite your children, tell them, hey, you're going to come, you're going to have a great time, your grandchildren, uh, neighborhood kids. We have a bunch of neighborhood kids who will probably be here as well. And I think they'll all be blessed if they do. So I hope you'll support it. Hey, I just want to welcome you and say hello and thank you for being here today. It means a lot to us that you would come to worship here with us at River Ridge Church. And uh, we're excited because um, the, the new church plant that we have in Trever Wilmot just ended their service. And uh, they are doing very well there. And we are very grateful. And uh, now we're trusting the Lord to kind of fill back up the seats. Uh, with people that uh, we sent over there to help start that church. And so I really encourage you, invite your neighbors and your friends. Uh, we, um, we left town about a month ago to go somewhere. The day we left town, three of our neighbors came to church here. So we decided we're leaving town again this week to see if we can get more neighbors uh, here. And, uh, but uh, we want to reach and impact our neighborhood for the gospel, and I know you do as well. So I hope you'll invite them and invite people to come to worship with us. Hey, if you're new and you're wondering how you can get uh, connected, we, we say worship, grow, serve, and share. Worship the Lord regularly is just a part of your life. Do it in, throughout the week, uh, just having a heart of gratitude to God and praising and honoring Him for the blessings in your life and worship Him together with your church family on Sundays. Then we say grow. Grow in your faith. And, you know, I always say to people, I can't promise you'll grow if you read the Bible, but I, I can promise you won't grow if you don't that you need the Bible. The, the word is, uh, is God-breathed, it says, and it's profitable for teaching, correct, or rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And so it's very profitable for us and encourage you to either get into a Bible study, join a connection group, get some way to be fed God's word, and uh, I think you'll be blessed. Serve the Lord in ministry. We have a variety of ministries here, VBS, children's ministries, adult ministries, youth ministries, but also we have ministries to the community like our Helping Hands Food Pantry. It starts this Thursday uh, right here in Spring Grove, and we need some help. Uh, typically, we need about 10 people to sign up every Tuesday and Thursday throughout the month of May. And uh, because of the starting of a new church, um, we haven't had as many people sign up, and we could use your help. And so you can sign up in the back as you leave today uh, in our little uh, uh, welcome center. You can go there and write your name down and let us know. and. It'll be on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 3.30 to 6.30, and we'd be very appreciative. And then we say share. Share your faith. Talk to people about your Jesus and, and trust that God is working in their life and uh, that they're ready to talk about him when he presents an opportunity for you. So worship, grow, serve, and share. Hey, I want to pray for us this morning, so I'd ask you to bow your heads and join me as we go before the Lord. Gracious Father, we just want to declare our love for you. Uh, it's in response to your love. It says you so love the world. And so we, we feel that love. We experience it. And we just return it. We return it to you. And uh, 
we know that if we knew nothing about you and you were just to appear, that we would fall on our faces and worship you because you're worthy of worship. But Lord, you have extended your grace and kindness to us in the person of your son, Jesus, who has come into this world and come as a human being to save human beings from the penalty and power of sin. And so we're grateful for that. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for being obedient to the point of death on the cross. We honor you this morning. We lift up your name and pray that if there's anyone here who doesn't yet have a relationship with you, that today might be that day when they turn from their sin and put their faith and trust in you. Uh, Lord, thank you for the opportunities we have to serve you and to take the baton of the gospel, take it into the world to be able to communicate our faith in Jesus. And I pray that we'd be busy doing that, uh, that we would be making disciples who can make disciples who can make disciples. So please help us to remain focused on the most important things. And now, Lord, as we study your word and talk about the communion of saints, that you will really speak to our hearts about that and the importance of it in each of our lives. We lift these things up to you and we pray for them in Jesus' name. Amen.
Go ahead and sit down. Children, you are dismissed. Sorry about that. Go ahead and go to Children's Church if you'd like to. I think some of you have already left, but if you'd like to go, please do. Apologize. Um, So uh, I'm kind of messing up today, aren't I? Because you know what we got to do now? Stand back up, okay? (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Oh, well, I hope you love me. Here we go. Philippians 2. 1 through 4, Philippians 2, 1 through 4. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility... Count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Please be seated. Well, over the last few months, we've been working through a series of called Affirming Our Faith Through the Apostles' Creed. Uh, you learn that it's the oldest and most widely accepted creed. It's accepted by Protestants and Catholics and Orthodox Christians around the world. Uh, Last week, we looked at the line that says, I believe in the Holy Christian Church. The actual phrase is the Holy Catholic Church, but the word Catholic means universal, and so I say the Holy Christian Church. Uh, And we distinguish between the universal church, which is made up of all believers since uh, the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 up until uh, the rapture of the church, and uh, it's God's redeemed church. And then the local church is a group of Christ followers who meet at a specific location to strategically reach their friends, family, and neighborhood with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so there's the universal church and the local church. And today I want to look at the next line of the Apostles' Creed, which is, I believe in the communion of saints. Uh, We normally receive communion on the first Sunday of every month when we come together and we say that the bread represents the body of Christ broken for us on the cross and the cup represents the blood of Christ shed for our sin. And uh, this forms a a special bond between Christians that unites us in Christ Jesus. Uh, At least that's what it's supposed to do, to unite Christians. Um, I was reading this week about two guys who were on a plane and uh, they were talking to each other and Eventually, uh, one of them turned the conversation to spiritual things, and he said uh, to the other, are, are you a Christian? And the fellow said, yes, as a matter of fact, I am. He said, well, wonderful. And after a little bit more conversation, he said, are you Protestant, Catholic, or Orthodox? He said, oh, I'm Protestant. Oh, that's terrific, so am I. The question has continued, are you a Calvinist or an Arminian in your theology? I'm happy to say that I'm a staunch Calvinist. That's fantastic. So am I. If you don't mind my asking, are you a Calvinistic Baptist or a Calvinistic Presbyterian? I am a Calvinistic Baptist. What a coincidence. He said, uh, so am I. Uh, And he said, and by heritage and by choice, I am proud to be so. And then he asked, are you a Northern Calvinistic Baptist or a Southern Calvinistic? Calvinistic Baptist, and the fellow said, I am a Northern Calvinistic Baptist. Unbelievable, so am I. May I ask if you're a Northern regular Calvinist Baptist, Calvinistic Baptist, or a Northern conservative Calvinistic Baptist? I am a Northern conservative Calvinistic Baptist. This is truly astounding. He said there's 
only about 200 of us in the whole world. And can you believe it? Two of us are sitting next to each other on an airplane. He said, tell me, sir, would you happen to be a northern conservative Calvinistic Baptist convention of 1844 or a northern conservative Calvinistic Baptist convention of 1868? Oh, I am a northern conservative Calvinistic Baptist convention of 1844. This is truly a miracle. I am too. And then he had one last question. He said, are you a northern conservative Calvinistic Baptist convention of 1844 King James version? Or are you a northern conservative Calvinistic Baptist convention of 1844 New International version? The fellow said, I'm a northern conservative Calvinistic Baptist of 1844 New International version. With that, the other fellow turned and looked away and said under his breath, Die, heretic, die. We laugh, but we also kind of frown because we know that a story like this can hit a little bit close to home, don't we? Uh, uh, we recognize often that Christians are more known for what separates us than for what unites us, but it shouldn't be this way. And so in an effort to help us understand what it means to enjoy the communion of saints, I want to spend a little bit of time with you this morning talking about what it is, where it comes from, how it's produced, and what it looks like when the church displays it together. So let's start with this. What is communion? Um, in my study for this message, I discovered that the actual phrase, the communion of saints, was added several centuries after the words, the Holy Catholic Christian Church in the Apostles' Creed. Uh, the question we have to ask ourselves is, why? Why did the church fathers feel it was necessary to add this statement uh, to precede a statement um, that sounds a lot like it? I mean, remember last week we noted that the word communion is taken from the Greek word, which means fellowship or partnership. Uh, it's that used that way in Philippians 1.5. It says, because of your fellowship or partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, Paul says to the Philippian church. That idea is that we share something together in a close relationship. Uh, and then today we talk about the communion of saints. The word saint comes from the Greek word hagias, which means holy one. And it isn't a word that's just meant to talk about super Christians like Billy Graham or a uh, famous missionary Hudson Taylor. It's, it's really applied evenly to Christians in the New Testament because we are all holy ones having been made so by the atoning sacrifice of Christ on the cross. So it, Paul greets the Philippian church and says to all the saints in Christ Jesus in Philippi, and he's including everybody. Everybody who's a believer is a saint. They're a holy one. So the phrase communion of saints refers to all true believers in heaven and on earth who share an intimate connection together due to our relationship with Jesus Christ. It's what all Christians partake in because we fellowship together in Christ. So here's how I distinguish between these two lines. The line we had last week, the Holy Christian Church, and the line of this week, the communion of saints. The first refers to Christ as the universal foundation of the church throughout the ages. Um, he is the, the reason that there, there is a church. He is the one who died for us and who brings us together under the banner of his name. The second is the fellowship that Christians enjoy together in community as we draw closer to the Lord Jesus Christ and as we live out our lives in the spirit of holiness. So scripture says this in Hebrews, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And that's what we try to do. We try to put, it, put off our sin put on the Spirit, live a holy life as under the Lord, and when we do, uh, something called the communion of saints takes place. Now, when we take literal communion on a Sunday morning, you may have noticed that I will often say something like this. I'll say, hey, you're invited today to take communion, and you don't have to be a member of this church. You don't have to be a regular attender. What you do have to be is a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ because that's who gets to experience the communion of saints. Um, the kind of communion that's described in scripture isn't based on our race, 
our education, our income, our skin color, our family background, or anything else, except that it is the shared desire to worship the Lord in the spirit of holiness. That's what it is. And it's no small thing to join in the community of the saints, communion of the saints. So let's talk for a moment about the source of communion. It says, so if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy. That's what it says in verse 1. Not every Christian, as we realize, is easy to get along with, right? I mean, we've had Christians that we differ in terms of how we think about things. And let's be honest, I liken it to getting married, right? When you become a part of the church, you're part of the bride of Christ. And when a couple gets married, I, I hardly want to say this to them in the premarital counseling, but when you bring two lives together, they, they come from different backgrounds and they have different families and they view the world differently. And, and so often it, it, it takes a little while to work that all out and uh, to get beyond the, these differences uh, in marriage. And the same thing is true when it comes to coming into the church. Uh, we may not always see eye to eye. And you add to that that there is a spiritual conflict taking place between the enemy who hates us and who wants to rob God of glory and is God's people, the church, and, and you know, uh, sometimes we experience anything but communion. So the unity of the body is a gift that comes from God, and it's something that we're to, to pursue. It says in Ephesians 4, 3, that we should be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And Paul gives us four kind of if statements. And it's, it's not his way of expressing doubt as if these things uh, might not happen. Um, I was watching the draft this week and I was thinking about it in terms of the Chicago Bears. You know, uh, if you prior to the draft had watched the Bears or followed them at all, and, and we were to say something like, if the Bears make it to the Super Bowl, you would think wishful thinking, never going to happen. They may be the worst offense in pro football. But after the draft, taking with the number one pick, a quarterback that they think is great, number two pick, a receiver, now I hear all these Bears fans who are optimistic. And when it says, if they reach the Super Bowl, they say, when is the Super Bowl? I want to make sure I have nothing else scheduled for that day so I can watch my Bears. When Paul writes this, he's, he's not doing the first thing. He's not going... We're not sure this is ever going to happen, but if it does, this is, this is what it'll look like. He's saying, we're, we're confident this is going to happen. And we're confident that certain things are going to take place in the body of Christ because we know this is going to happen. Paul says he knows that there is encouragement. Remember, I talked about encouragement is from a French word that means to put courage into someone because of our union in Christ. He knows that there is comfort from God's love. He knows that there is a communion in the spirit. He knows that there is affection and sympathy that Christians show for one another. And the reason he knows it is because Paul understands where it comes from. It says here in scripture that our communion with Christ is based on our, is the basis of our communion with one another. In other words, we have communion with Christ and so now, because of that, we can have communion, fellowship, partnership with each other. Uh, one flows from the other. As Ray Pritchard says, he's one of my favorite preachers, he says, it's not as if God says, do this and I will bless you. Rather, he says, because I have blessed you, now do this. In other words, look, I've already given you every blessing you need for life and godliness. You have it, now go do it. Go do it. And that's what it means to have communion, is to live that out in our lives. Paul talks about three essentials of communion. He says, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in a full accord and one mind. Three ingredients that kind of produce the communion of saints. And the first one is a shared mind. Uh, he calls it the same mind, being of the same mind. So when it comes to our, our fellowship with each other, uh, we, we have to learn to think the same about certain issues when it comes to the Christian life. Uh, we, we have to 
believe some similar things, believe the same things. That's why we're studying the Apostles' Creed. Uh, I, a little while ago, I was asking my connection group, I said, uh, let me ask you this question. What are the things that a Christian must believe to be a Christian? And they looked at me like, what? And I said, well, let's be, let's be honest, let's look at it. I said, do you have to believe in the rapture to be a Christian? And they said, no. I said, no, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, I believe in the rapture, but I'm not sure that's necessary to be a Christian. I mean, there certainly are Christians around the world who do not believe in the rapture. I said, what do you have to believe in? And so they started making a list. And they said, well, you have to believe that one God exists eternally in three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. I said, I agree, you have to believe that. If you don't believe that, then there's no way that God can bring his saving grace to our lives. So you have to believe that. You, you have to believe that Jesus Christ is God and he's man. He's fully human, he's fully divine. I said, yes, it's true. Because no man can save us from our sin because he must die for his own sin. So the son of God had to become a human being and then live out a sinless and faultless life before his father so that he could become the sacrifice for our sins. You're right, you have to believe that. And they said, yeah, that's true. They said, you have to believe not only in the death of Christ, but the resurrection of Christ. I said, yep, you do. Because if Christ only died and he wasn't resurrected, then the fact is he's no different than the rest of us. He's just in the grave and that would be what's going to happen to all of us. And I said, what else? And they said, well, you know, you have to believe that when he ascended to heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit to be with the church for, for the rest of our time. And I said, yes, you do. You have to believe in that. Because it's the work of the Holy Spirit that brings regeneration to us, who comes into our lives and applies Christ's sacrifice to us so that we're forgiven of sin. You have to believe those things. There has to be one mind when it comes to certain doctrines of the church. We have to believe in those specific things. Without them, I think you could say you are probably not a Christian. So it's a shared mind. It's a shared heart. Uh, he says, same love. Uh, this is the love that comes from God and touches us in a very personal way. Uh, it enables us to love each other differently. Uh, that we love each other the way God loves us. It's a self-sacrificing uh, love that, uh, that cares deeply for others and is willing to pay a price to express that. Uh, and by the way, I just want, I thought I'd take this moment just to say that, um, you know, our church has been there for about six and a half years now, River Ridge Church, and I've been the pastor since the beginning, and I have always felt your love. I just want to say thank you. I always have, and I'm very grateful, and it means the world to me. When I look out there, I, I see brothers and sisters, and I see friends and family. And I just want to say, on behalf of, of me and my family, thank you. It means a lot to us. You may not know all my family. I always tell people the best way to, to figure out who my family is is just count every sixth person and say, that's probably someone related to Carrie uh, here in the church uh, because I have a lot of family here. Um, but we've all felt loved by you. And, and that's what it says is part of the communion of the saints is a shared love that we, we do things for each other because we love one another. So someone has to move, and we say, I hate moving, but I'll be there. I'll be there. Or someone else is sick and, and needs a visit in the hospital, and so we go, or we take a meal to their house, or, or we do whatever it is that demonstrates love. That's what we do for each other. It's a shared love. And there's one more, and that's what I call a shared soul. It's, it says, being a full accord in one mind. Uh, I like the Peterson translation. It says, be deep-spirited friends. In the Greek, it's expressed as one-souled. It's a heartfelt unity of mind and purpose that demonstrates love and respect for each other. I, I think that's a little bit of what Paul means when he says Christians uh, commune together because we have a shared soul. Uh, we understand that when one wins... We all win. 
you know, I, I like sports. I played sports when I was young, played them in my 30s, maybe my 40s, and always enjoyed them. And, um, you know, I remember playing on a baseball team in college, and, and uh, one year in particular, we had a really good season. And when I look back on that season, I reflect on it, here's what I think. You know, you know why we were able to win that year? Because we had a team of unselfish baseball players. No one was out there saying, look at me, look at me, look at me. We just all wanted to win. And when someone did good, we all cheered them. When someone didn't do well, we all were there to say, we'll pick you up, buddy, we'll pick you up. You know, it, it, we're going to win this game. There was just no selfishness, no pride. We, we just were in it to win it. I was thinking about uh, in, in the 1980s, there was a classic basketball series. It happened almost every year for the NBA Finals with the Boston Celtics playing the Los Angeles Lakers. And if you're my age, maybe you saw some of those games. And I remember one particular game, it was in, in Boston. And uh, so they introduced the Lakers lineup first. And I was a Lakers fan. I loved Magic Johnson and those guys. And so it said, starting at center, and they never make a big deal about it, and you're a visiting team. It says, starting at center for the Los Angeles Lakers, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Starting at point guard, Magic Johnson. Starting at... Uh, 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 forward, small forward, James Worthy, starting at power forward, Michael Cooper, starting at shooting guard, Byron Scott. And that crowd, yeah, big deal. And then they introduce the Celtics. And when they introduce them, here's what they say. Starting at center, Robert Parrish. And the crowd goes crazy. Robert Parrish. He's not as good as Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, but he's their center and they love him. And, and then they say, starting at power forward, Kevin McHale. And Kevin McHale comes out and again, the crowd goes nuts. And then they say, starting at point guard, Danny Ainge. And Danny Ainge comes out and, and the crowd cheers. And then starting at shooting guard, Dennis Johnson. And I remember as I was watching that, taking it in, and the guy who was announcing this uh, on TV as they were watching him, he made a comment at this point. He said, there stand four really good basketball players. And then, of course, they introduced the last one. The last one, they said, and starting at small forward is Larry Bird. And the crowd went nuts. And they started screaming. And, you know, it just probably went on for a minute as they just screamed for Larry Bird. And the announcer said something that really caught my eye. He's, he said this, he said, before, when the four guys were standing there, he said, there are four really good basketball players. Larry Bird joins them and he says, there are five really great basketball players. What happened? The only thing that happened was Larry Bird was introduced. He walked onto the floor and what the announcer was saying was, he elevated everybody's game so that they went from being good to really good, to being great basketball players. Now, the thing I liked about Larry Bird, and I wasn't a Celtics fan, was this. You never heard him argue if he was the greatest player who ever played the game. He didn't care. If, if he could win by scoring 15 points and getting 15 rebounds, he would. If he needed to score 40, he'd do that. Whatever it took he would do for the team to win. Because he understood that when one wins, they all win. And when you look at the body of Christ, there, there ought to be some of that. That that's part of that communion. That we don't particularly care how much glory we get. We, we care about how much glory God gets. And we're in it together. And we commune together. And we build each other up. And we try to make each other better in Christ than we would be if we weren't together. That's the communion of saints. And that's what God wants for all of us. That's a shared soul. We are one soul in purpose. And that is that all of us would bring honor and glory to the Lord. Then he shares two results of communion. He says, do nothing from rivalry or conceit. You know, people can do that, right? Uh, we can compete against each other or be conceited. I, I confess I've done that before. He says, but in humility, count one another more significant than yourselves. 
Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. So two applications for us this morning. The first is this, is that if you want to have the communion of saints, you need a new attitude toward others, a new attitude toward others. It means no more selfish ambition, no more rivalries. We recognize that our goal isn't to exalt ourselves, it's to exalt the Lord. That's what the psalmist said, exalt the Lord our God and worship at his footstool. We stop thinking that this is all about us. We don't have to have our way. We focus no more on what divides the body, but what unites it. We don't deny the truth, but we stop using it to justify our behaviors or to beat someone over the head with it because we love them. We have a new attitude toward others. We also have a new attitude toward ourselves. It begins with humility. Last week we talked about humility and we said that humility is a lowly, lowliness of mind. I, I like to define it like this. I think it's right, but you can tell me later. I, I say that humility is having a, a realistic view of who you are in light of who God is. Did you hear that? It's, it's having a realistic understanding of who you are in light of who God is. And when you recognize that God is the only one who is great, then you have your place in the world. And you know that you're not the one who's to be worshipped. You're not the one who's to be exalted. That's the Lord. In fact, we're called to humble ourselves and, and uh, to, to serve others. And so it's that new attitude toward ourselves. There is only one who is great, and it is not us. So how do we develop humility? I, I would say two things. Uh, number one is by admitting that we can be proud, that we can be insecure, and in our insecurities seek to exalt ourselves. We want people's attention. We want their accolades. So we, we exalt ourselves, which, by the way, was the sin of Satan. So be careful with pride. Don't minimize it. Read Isaiah 14, and you'll learn that Lucifer, the Satan, uh, that he had pride in heaven, and God kicked him out of it because of it. And so uh, if you struggle and you're not experiencing the communion of saints, you, you might need to start with, am I thinking wrongly about myself? Uh, you know, Scripture doesn't tell us to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to. Uh, so don't focus on your abilities. Focus on your availability to the God who will use you. That's how it works. From time to time, we all need an attitude adjustment. It's just the way it is in this life. In heaven, we won't need that, but we do now. And if your pride stands in the way of you experiencing true communion with other Christians and together fulfilling our one sole purpose of honoring and glorifying the Lord, then maybe you need to deal with that attitude and get a new attitude. A new attitude that says, it's about you, Lord, it's not about me. I just want to be able to bless my brothers and sisters in Christ, so that in a sense we can all win together. I read this story this week. The last thing that LaShonda Calloway saw before she died was people literally stepping over her to continue shopping as if nothing had happened. Calloway had stopped to shop at a convenience store in Wichita, Kansas, when she was stabbed in an altercation. As she lay dying, your surveillance camera recorded no less then five people stepping over her to continue down the store's house. Only one stopped briefly to take a picture of Callaway, Callaway with a cell phone camera. Uh, a police spokesman named Gordon Bassam said it was tragic to watch. The fact that people were more interested in taking a picture with a cell phone and shopping for snacks than helping this young, innocent woman is quite frankly revolting. Wichita Police Chief Norman Williams had stronger words. He says, that's crazy. What happened to our respect for life? You, you may disagree with my answer to his question, but here it is anyways. The further away we move from God, the further away we move from each other. And we stop caring. So if you find today that your heart isn't quite where it needs to be, Maybe you're not burdened by the, by the challenges that others face. I'm going to tell you how to fix it. It's to draw near to God. It's to start by 
pursuing him. And he will change what goes on in here. And he'll help you not to focus on yourself, but on the good of others so that you can experience the communion of saints. Yeah, we're going to say the Apostles' Creed together. Would you stand and we'll read it together from the screen? Just follow along with me, if you would, please. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Let's respond as we sing, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
that we do need some help with the Helping Hands Food Pantry. We don't have enough signed up yet. If you're able to help this Thursday, that's our first time from 3.30 to 6.30, sign up in the Welcome Center as you leave today and let us know that. We'll send a reminder out. If you're able to help on another Tuesday or Thursday, we'd be very grateful. Uh, the Bible says many hands make light work, and we'd appreciate it if you consider doing that. Uh, also, if you want to be a volunteer for VBS, register online. If you have students who are ready to register, put their names down and register them as well. And uh, we'll get that thing together and we'll minister to a lot of kids with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So please consider doing that. Uh, if you need prayer after the service, I'll be up here to pray with you. You just come on up and see me and I'll pray. Now please receive the benediction. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you today and remain with you always. Amen. God bless you. Go in peace and serve the Lord.